All right, so I have just focused uh, on a cell uh, with the 63x objective. I'm still in locate mode. I am now going to go to acquisition mode. So let's take a look at this. When you switch objectives, you will likely need to make adjustments to your settings. So let's do those adjustments uh, one channel at a time. So you know, before we start, we can use, uh, again, we, we want to make sure that the pinhole is set correctly when we change the objective. Um, in many cases, that is true, but sometimes when you switch between particular objectives, you need to double check the pinhole. So if I go to Alexa Floor 594, the pinhole you can set is at, set at one area unit. The diameter is 48.3, which is different from before. It's the same here, the same here, so that's great. Um, all right, so. Let's take a look and see what the image uh, looks like. So if we go to live, range indicator. So I want to reset all of this. Um, there we go. So if I change the focus, I'm moving the focus knob manually now and just seeing the effect on the image. Seems to have gone too far out of focus. There we go. If I go to histogram, okay, so what are my intensities? They're close to what I would want them to be. I can maybe go up a little bit in, in laser power. It's maybe too much, so let me go down and gain a little bit. What I'm looking when I say too much is at these values, I want the maximum intensity pixels to be somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500. So let me go down a little bit more in game. There we go. So that's about where I want it. The quality is quite good. If I look at the bleaching, I don't really see this going down significantly. Uh, so this looks like a good start. So let's try the other channels. I didn't have to make too many adjustments. Let's look at 488. Range indicator. So you can see in comparison, there's an extraordinary amount of detail. So I'm just going to move in Z to make sure that I have the brightest Z plane. Okay. There we go. That seems to be the brightest location that I can find. So this is a little bit dimmer than I would like. Um, I can increase the laser power a little bit. There we go. Uh, I want to make sure that the display settings are reset. Dimensions. OK, so you can see that the mini intensity uh, doesn't seem to be going down significantly. The intensities here are about where I want them, so this looks pretty good. Let's do the DAPI now. range indicator, make sure the display is reset. So I don't get confused, because if the display weren't reset, I could see something like this and be worried about saturation. But if I actually measured it, I can see there is no saturation. So I want to reset it so I don't get confused by that. Um, for the DAPI, I'm not interested in quality so much, so I'm just going to increase the gain a little bit. OK, um, that looks perfectly acceptable to me. So now if we take an image. you can see the quality is significantly higher in terms of resolution, so in terms of details, than it was with the 20X. But the price we pay is our field of view is much smaller. So what I'm going to discuss in the next uh, few minutes is how to get the most in terms of resolution uh, out, of this, uh, out of this microscope. And so the thing you need to understand is, is the critical parameter that we're trying to uh, adjust to get higher resolution is the pixel size. So in this room, there is a table on the wall that shows you the minimum pixel sizes for different combinations of fluorophores and objectives. For example, for the 63x oil objective that we are using right now and Alexa Fluor 594, the minimum recommended pixel size is 0.13 microns.
if we wanted the highest possible detail, we would have to make the pixel size 0.13. In reality, we can actually make it a little bit smaller than that. We can push that to two thirds of that value. So two thirds of 0.13 is around 0.08. Um, but really we can't push it much more than that. So the pixel size, uh, sort of the minimum pixel size for the highest level of detail for this kind of sample would probably be around the order of 80 nanometers. Uh, if we push it further than that, if we make a pixel size of 20 nanometers or 40 nanometers, it's just going to lead to empty magnification. It won't get us any extra detail. It'll cost us time and it will cost us bleaching. So how do we set that pixel size to what we want? So here, I strongly recommend that you look at my uh, confocal microscopy video because I have a, a detailed explanation uh, of how zoom, image size, pixel size, and frame size interact. Uh, right now, I'm just going to go through the mechanics of how to adjust these things, but I won't go into uh, too much into sort of how, how and, and, and why they're related. So you have, uh, let's say we decide we want the highest detail possible. We want a detail uh, with a pixel size of 0.08. So we have two options to get that detail. One is to use a big image with a lot of pixels. So we'll have a big image size, a lot of pixels, so it just take longer to take the image. The other is to zoom in only to what we want uh, and have a smaller image uh, with those small pixel sizes. And the way we, we, we adjust things to, to to get those two extremes is either by adjusting the frame size or the zoom, okay? Uh, so typically in the workflow that I recommend, and again, I, I strongly recommend you check out that video, what I say is first figure out what detail you need, that'll fix your pixel size, then figure out what image size you need uh, because that will determine your zoom. So if you look here, if you go to live, uh, let's, let's do it um, just with the 488 channel. It's gonna be easier. Go to live. Let's make sure we're in the proper focal plane. There we go. So if you look at this, um, you can see that my zoom is one and I have an image size of about 100 by 100 microns. So this is 100 and this is 100 microns and I can fit in a sort of a nice cell. So this looks like a good size. If I reduce the zoom, uh, excuse me, if I reduce the image size by increasing the zoom, I will get higher resolution. So you can see the pixel size shrinking but I don't fit the entire cell in my, field, in my field of view. So this is a case where it doesn't seem like it would make much sense to, to make the pixel size smaller by zooming in. Rather, what I need to look for is making the pixel size hit my intended target by increasing the frame size, okay? And so to get to a pixel size of about 0.8, I'll probably have to take the frame size to something like 1500. So here I'm increasing the number of pixels in the image. So uh, yeah, that's about where I want it. Let's just make it a little bit lower. Get it to 0.8, not overshoot. Okay, so now um, I have more pixels than I had before. I have a pixel size that's much smaller because all of those pixels are in, in, in an image of the same size. So if I snap an image, uh, let me just max out the speed before I do that. Again, when you're changing the frame size and the zoom, always max out the speed before you do anything. Let me just snap an image. This gives me an image of the highest possible quality. So you can see, I can see all these fine uh, sort of details inside the image. Okay, so uh, the, the major cost here is in addition to bleaching uh, time. So it takes a lot of time to take this image. It takes about 10 seconds to take the single plane. And so that's when you need to start trading off things. So maybe uh, you don't need to do as much averaging. So you can go to uh, an averaging of one instead of four and you trade off quality for time. And so it's possible that this kind of uh, image, uh, if you take a Z stack, which I'll show you in a second, you can uh, then recover some of the quality by running an algorithm called uh, deconvolution on these images, okay? 
uh, and that may be a more efficient way of uh, kind of getting more quality than trying to do it on the microscope itself, where it will cost you a, a lot of time. All right, so, so that, that is an example of what it would look like at 0.08. You could also have gone to 0.14, and whether to go to a pixel size of 0.13 or 0.14 or 0.08 really depends on, again, the level of detail that you need in the images and, and what you're willing to pay to get that level of detail. Um, let's say we, we, we decide that with an averaging of 2, we get the contrast that we want, and with a pixel size of 0.8, we get the resolution that we want. Um, how do we take a z-stack? So how do we take uh, a series of images uh, separated uh, in the z dimension periodically to then reconstruct this in three dimensions? So to do that, we're going to click here on z stack. And if we scroll down, we'll now have this z stack uh, window. And so the, the main thing we need to do here is to tell the system where we want to start the Z stack, where we want to end it, and what the spacing needs to be. So we don't put in the total number of slices. We, what we want is to put in the interval. So the software will subject, suggest an optimal interval. Uh, that works well if you're using uh, the pixel size value uh, that's on the table on the wall in, in, in the LSM 700 or LSM 710 room. If you want the highest, which in this case is 0.13, just take my word for that. Um, if you're using the highest value, which is sort of the highest possible resolution, which is a pixel size around two thirds of what's on that table, in this case 0.08, you want to use instead an interval of 0.2, okay? So that's if you want the highest possible resolution, you want to use that interval size. So let's, let's set this up. I'm gonna to go to live. So now that we have the interval, what I want to do is I want to set the bottom. So I want to set set first. I'm going down by turning the focus knob toward me. I'm going to say set first. So right below where we start to see the signal. And then set last on the other side. So if I stop it here, you can see that 16 slices. If you look here, you'll see that each scan, the scan time for each slice is going to be about five seconds. Uh, so that means that you will have so uh, about 80 seconds worth of imaging. All right, so if I now click on Start Experiment, not Snap. Snap will take a single image. If I click on Start Experiment, it will do sort of what it shows here, a single channel Z-Stack, because I've, I only have this channel checked on. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check on all channels. I'm going to take this Z-Stack. I'll stop the video, and then I'll show you the results. All right, so I'm going to start it by clicking here. As this goes, this will fill up these different uh, you know, these different little vignettes uh, or tiles with an image of what was at that plane. So I'm going to pause the video and I'll come back when this is done. All right, so you can see the result of the um, of the completed Z stack. Um, in this gallery view, you can see the different images that were taken. If you go to the 2D view you now have a Z position slider, which allows you to move in the Z dimension and see all the different planes. Another useful display mode is orthogonal view, where you can see side cuts of the image. So this is the image in XY, and then these are views uh, of, the, uh, of the image uh, stack in YZ or XZ. And this is particularly useful if you have a thicker sample uh, so you can sort of cut it here at this red line and look at it from uh, the side, as it were, and you get this view, uh, or cut it at the green line and look at it from uh, sort of the, seeing it, uh, see, seeing Z uh, X planes, uh, and you can change where you do that by moving. This is very useful uh, in, in, in larger samples, and please let me know if you have samples like that, and I can explain in more detail how, how this works. Um, all right, so now we have... Uh, this image. Let me just save it, and then I'll show you uh, a few more things. Uh, so there are uh, a few more useful things. Uh, one is if we went to a lot of uh, trouble to make these settings, if you come next time to the microscope and someone has been using another setting, so something like this, for example, Dappy and M Cherry, for whatever reason, you don't want to 
have to load the default, the you know, the settings, MSL dappy 48594, and then put in all the stuff that we did before. Instead, what you can do is open this image and click reuse. What reuse will do is it will reload all the settings of this image exactly as it was acquired. The only thing that it won't change is uh, the objective, which you will have to uh, change on the software. Uh, so basically, if you go to info, every single thing in here except the objective, which will be reload, which will be, excuse me, reloaded exactly as you used it to acquire an image. Okay, um, so that that is something very useful to just uh, kind of get going faster when you start up. Um, the other thing that I want to show you is if I unclick ZStack, uh, you can take a tile scan. So you can take multiple images uh, distributed in XY with this feature. And so you can do that by going down here, clicking on tile scan. And you can say, for example, that you want a, you know, a two by two tile. And so what it'll do uh, is it'll take images that will be one here, one here, one here, and one here. That's particularly useful if you have a tissue and you want to uh, capture a larger area. When you do that, you should leave an overlap of around 10% between the images. Uh, it's a good idea to click on bidirectional so that the stage moves in a snake pattern to, st uh, to go faster. And I suggest you, you click on online stitching so that you get a stitched image at the end. So let's just uh, use this as an example. Uh, I'm going to briefly focus before I do this. So I'm going to unclick the 594 and the 488, go to live. There we have the cell. And I'm only going to do this in this channel. Say stop and start experiment just so you can see it quickly. You can see it's a two by two tile. So this allows us the same resolution we had before, but just in a larger image. Okay, so this is more suited for tissue, but I don't have a tissue sample, so that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, on this one, okay? Um, finally, one thing that's actually uh, you can do uh, on the, uh, more so on the LSM 710, is you can make the scanner go bi-directionally. So right now the laser turns on in one direction, but then turns off when the, when, when the moves the position back. Uh, and so if you, if you make it, if you set uh, the scanning to bi-directional, you can go faster because the laser goes back and forth, back and forth. And it's a substantial effect. You can go faster by a factor of two, but the problem is it can lead to some artifacts, particularly on the 700. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, so let me see, maybe this is not the best channel to show you those artifacts. Let me show you with the DAPI. I'm gonna show you why that is sometimes not a great idea. Okay, so let me go to range indicator. All right, so let me zoom in a little bit. So what happens sometimes if you do this is that the edges of things become fuzzier than if you weren't doing it. Um, so you can see some ali aliasing, and so that looks a bit like this um, usually. So you see sometimes this kind of effect. Uh, and so if you see that effect, uh, don't use the bidirectional. But if you don't, um, you can use it and it will significantly speed up your acquisition by a factor of two. So it's just a matter of testing it once you have it. Uh, don't mess with these values. I just did that so that you could get a sense of uh, how things look. If when you put on bidirectional, you don't see a difference uh, in, the, in, in sort of the the, the quality of the image, use it because you'll go much faster. If you do see a difference, then don't uh, because that's going to cause all sorts of problems. Okay. Um, stop it there. It, it, interestingly, it didn't seem to cause problems here, which is, which is great because it means that I can take a single image uh, in a fraction of the time that it took before. Um, so that concludes the sort of points I wanted to make about laser scanning confocal microscopy. Uh, I hope you found this useful as a refresher to what to do. And as always, please let me know if you have any questions.